Hello and welcome to The Lincoln Journey. I'm your host, Grant Veter, and today I will present part two of The Conspirators, the story of the Lincoln assassination. We left off last time with John Wilkes Booth assembling a group of accomplices to kidnap President Lincoln. As Booth was making these plans, did he sense that time was running out? In August of 1864, when he recruited Arnold and O'Loughlin, there was at least some hope for the South. Confederate forces were on the defensive nearly everywhere, but Union efforts to end the war with one mighty blow resulted in a summer of disastrous defeats, which left the North so weary of the war that Lincoln himself expected he would lose his bid for re-election. But then Sherman took Atlanta on September 1st. General Sheridan scourged Virginia's Shenandoah Valley, the South's breadbasket, in October. Hope renewed. The North gave a landslide victory to Lincoln on November 8th. He received 55% of the popular vote and 212 electoral votes to 21 for his opponent, General George B. McClellan, whom Lincoln had fired two years earlier from his command of the Army of the Potomac. The South was back on its heels now. If it was going to make use of thousands of POWs freed and exchanged for a kidnapped president, it would needed them yesterday. And what was Booth doing? 17 days after the election, he was in New York playing in Julius Caesar with brothers Junius and Edwin in a benefit performance in aid of a statue of Shakespeare to be erected in Central Park. In this play, Brutus, who was devoted to the Roman Republic, helps to assassinate Caesar, who has taken dictatorial powers. For the record, Wilkes Booth, like most Southerners, believed that Lincoln, who suspended habeas corpus during the war and had thousands arrested on charges that would never hold up in peacetime had assumed dictatorial powers. There is, however, no indication that Brutus first planned to kidnap Caesar and smuggle him into Virginia. Ironically, Edwin Booth, who stood four square for the North and often quarreled with his brother John about the war, played the part of the assassin Brutus, while John played Mark Antony, who defeated Brutus in the civil war that broke out after Caesar's death. Junius played Cassius, who has one of my favorite Shakespeare speeches, the one where he says about Caesar, I had as lief not be as lived to be in awe of such a thing as I myself. <clears throat> Meanwhile, the Lincolns had returned to the White House before Election Day. It wouldn't have taken an especially alert Confederate spy to gather this information, if it was anything like their return from the soldiers' home the previous year, when the Lincolns were accompanied back to the executive mansion by 19 loads of furniture. The point being that Booth and others would know that Lincoln would no longer be commuting daily between the White House and the summer cottage. Opportunities to accost him on a deserted strip of country road would be scarce. Booth, however, continued to prepare. In December, he was back in Prince George's and Charles Counties, Maryland, where he made the acquaintance of Confederate spy Thomas Harbin, who agreed to conceal a boat that would be used to cross the Potomac with the kidnapped president. On the same trip, he became familiar with Dr. Samuel Mudd and spent a night at his house. The Mudd connection is a huge can of worms, which we will eventually reluctantly open. To a large extent, we can only guess what was going through Booth's mind all this time. I'm going to guess that he knew that the South's increasingly desperate situation meant the war might be over sooner rather than later, barring some dramatic development like the freeing of tens of thousands of Confederate POWs. I'm guessing that this made him want to amend his plan for kidnapping the president, given that Lincoln was no longer commuting to work. This would explain why on Christmas Day he was trying to recruit an actor friend of his in New York by describing a kidnapping that would take place at Ford's Theater in Washington. As 1865 dawned, Booth and company continued to get organized. Booth was in New York on January 11th, buying two Spencer repeating carbines 
six Colt revolvers, three Bowie knives, ammunition, belts, and two pair of handcuffs. Thomas Harbin and John Surratt, the Surratt that got away, bought a boat in Port Tobacco, Maryland on January 14th and engaged an oarsman to carry their cargo across the Potomac. Michael Laughlin and Sam Arnold, with the horse and buggy Arnold had bought on instructions from Booth, took Booth's guns from Baltimore to Washington, where they checked into a hotel. A short time later, Booth met them for dinner and revealed that he was thinking of snatching Lincoln from Ford's theater rather than the 7th Street Turnpike. The boys from Baltimore were chagrined. While an abduction in the countryside seemed marginally plausible, snatching the President of the United States from a crowded theater in the middle of the nation's capital sounded unhinged. But Booth claimed he had it all worked out, and he took them through the theater to demonstrate the efficacy of his plan. He somehow managed to convince them to stay involved. On January 20th, Booth played the lead in Romeo and Juliet at a DC theater, probably Grover's National. It was his first performance since Julius Caesar in November, and only his second since the previous May. The next day, John Surratt went to Baltimore where he met an associate in the Confederate spy network who introduced him to a prospective recruit, Lewis Powell. It was a most consequential meeting. Powell, 21, was also known as Lewis Payne. The quiet giant was a veteran of Mosby's Rangers, a guerrilla-like unit of Confederate cavalry. When the conspirators' plot climaxed, Powell would vie with Wilkes Booth for the title of most active assassin. Powell lives in infamy, but John Surratt was Booth's most necessary accomplice. He knew the escape route. He knew the people in Southern Maryland who would provide assistance. His sympathetic mother, the Surratt who didn't get away, owned a tavern in Surrattsville, 10 miles south of Washington, and a house on H Street in Washington. Both buildings were already Confederate safe houses. Both became central to the plot, especially the house on H Street, which Mary Surratt had turned into a boarding house. It became a much used, but not the only meeting place for the conspirators. Powell would become a boarder there in late February, using yet another assumed name. The oarsman that Surratt and Harbin engaged in Port Tobacco was a seedy Prussian immigrant named George Atzerat. He was a veteran smuggler who otherwise seemed to have little ambition. He had a tendency to drink too much and to talk too much when he drank. He also sought to board at the house on 8th Street in February, but Mary Surratt found him so abominable that he was forced to find accommodations elsewhere. However, he visited 8th Street so often that Mary's daughter, Anna Surratt, gave him a nickname. She couldn't pronounce Atzerat, so she called him Port Tobacco. Those who remember this story know that there is one more key conspirator. Davy Harold was a 20-year-old pharmacy clerk when Booth met him in 1863. Despite his stardom, Booth could be unaffected and friendly around the little people, and he found in Harold a devoted admirer. Harold's familiarity with Southern Maryland as a frequent hunter there made him an ideal candidate for the plot. As February turned to March, Booth held meetings with his Confederates, some clandestine, some fairly public. In American Brutus, Michael Kaufman convincingly postulates that Booth contrived to bind his accomplices to him by publicly doing business with them and carrying on incriminating correspondences with them. If they got cold feet, he would remind them that there was a body of evidence tying them to the conspiracy, whether they went through with it or not. Kaufman also points out that under the rules of evidence at that time, Quote, the words of a defendant were admissible only if he uttered them during the commission of the crime, unquote. Thus, no one charged with the conspiracy would be allowed to testify against Booth in court. On March 4th, Abraham Lincoln was sworn in for his second term as president. In his inaugural address, to me the most sublime public paper in the American political canon, he spoke of malice toward none and charity for all as an end to hostilities hove into view. But bitter Southerners like Booth were still blind to the compassionate and forgiving Lincoln. Booth was present at the inauguration. What an excellent chance I had to kill the president if I had wished on inauguration day, he told a friend a month later.
I was on the stand as close to him nearly as I am to you. Researchers have found in pictures a face in the crowd that looks very much like Booth, several yards above and to the left rear of the president. Was he already planning to kill the president on March 4th? When did the kidnapping plot become an assassination plot? And which of the conspirators knew about it or agreed to it or actually took part in it? Well, one thing at a time. The intentions of Booth toward Lincoln took a nasty turn somewhere in the first three months of 1865. In the minds of some scholars, Booth's somewhat casual revelation to fellow conspirators Arnold and O'Loughlin in January that he wanted to kidnap Lincoln from a theater rather than a remote rural setting indicates that he had murder on his mind then. Did he seriously think he could pull off an abduction from a theater is how they look at it. The gang kept occupied during this time purchasing horses, arms, a boat, and a buggy, and studying an escape route, but these could be in service of either a kidnapping or an assassination. By mid-March, Booth was getting serious about an incident of some sort at a theater. He examined the ins and outs at both Ford's and Grover's theaters. He was a familiar face at both, and his comings and goings wouldn't arouse much suspicion. His main focus was on Ford's theater. On the evening of March 15th, he took a party there to see the tragedy of Jane Shore. Jane Shore was a mistress of King Edward IV of England, who was accused of conspiracy by Richard III. Make of that what you will. While Booth mingled with the theater company, John Surratt and Lewis Powell watched the play from the presidential box with two young ladies who were also boarders at the house on H Street. Booth wanted to familiarize Surratt and Fowle with the theater's features, like he had with Arnold and O'Loughlin in January. By the way, Arnold and O'Loughlin had met Surratt briefly, but they were completely unaware of the other conspirators. This would change that night. After the play, the gentlemen dropped off the ladies at the boarding house close to midnight, and then went out again. Another boarder, Louis Weichmann, much more on him later, asked them where they were going. Mind your own business, retorted Surratt. Their destination was a restaurant where Booth had rented a room stocked with food, liquor, and cigars. He sent Davy Harold to collect Arnold and O'Loughlin. They didn't even know a meeting was scheduled, much less have acquaintance with the participants. When all were assembled, the party consisted of Booth, Arnold, O'Loughlin, Surratt, Harold, Powell, and Atzerott. The men played cards until the last of the restaurant's waiters left at 1.30 a.m. Then Booth got down to business. He explained to them the plan that he had spent months devising. It went like this. On a night when Lincoln was attending a play at Ford's Theater, several of the conspirators would be in attendance. When the signal was given, some of them would rush into the president's box above stage left. They would seize him and handcuff him. They would wrestle him over the railing and lower him to the stage and into the hands of Lewis Powell. They would all then gather around Lincoln and escort him to the waiting carriage behind the theater. After a quick exit from the city, they would meet Surratt and Harold south of town, having crossed a guarded bridge, mind you. Before you knew it, they would traverse the 40 miles to their hidden boat on the Potomac, which Atzerott would row to the Virginia shore. They would then be only about 70 miles from Richmond. If this plan seems somehow unfeasible to you, Think how it would sound if you were one of the principal actors in it, hearing it for the first time. The group had a number of objections. Booth blithely amended the plan to counter each one. Samuel Arnold, whose statement to the authorities and later memoir are the main sources for what occurred at the meeting, wanted to know what the purpose of the kidnapping would be, recalling that the whole point was supposed to be to trade Lincoln for rebel POWs. Arnold pointed out that the troop exchange that had been suspended in 1863 was reinstated by General Grant in January of 1865. Booth had to concede this, but argued that Lincoln could be held hostage for other purposes beneficial to the Confederacy. Arnold continued to argue, saying, I want a shadow of a chance. When Booth responded angrily, Arnold said, you can be the leader of the party, but not my executioner. Booth reminded him that he had taken an oath of secrecy and good faith the prior August. He became threatening, saying, Do you know you are liable to be shot? Arnold said that Booth broke the pact when he changed the plan and retorted, If you feel inclined to shoot me, you have no farther to go. 
I shall defend myself. This late in the game, Booth could not afford to lose one of his most dependable accomplices and possibly others. He made a strategic retreat and agreed to return to the original plan. Only partially mollified, Arnold said that they must act immediately. Gentlemen, he said, if this is not accomplished this week, I forever withdraw from it. Remembering that Arnold himself is the one recalling all this bravado, we can be forgiven for thinking that he may have exaggerated his courageous utterances. But he had certainly presented Booth with a dilemma. In addition to being deeply involved with many of the details of the plot, Arnold and Lachlan, unwilling to be found with a cache of weapons, had hidden several of them with a party unknown to Booth. As the group left the restaurant at 5 a.m. on March 16th, Booth may have seen his plan crumbling. Whether he was still serious about an abduction or else preparing for an assassination unbeknownst to his fellow conspirators, he needed to be able to rely on Arnold's silence, and he needed those guns. Will Booth's self-possession and ingenuity help him overcome these obstacles? We hope not, but probably. Find out more next time in The Conspirators, Part 3. Thank you.